amazing day it has been so far. Um, the, the speakers from all around, it's just been so uplifting to be a part of it. My name is Shannon Biggs, and I'm the director of Movement Rights, based in the United States. And I'm also part of the executive committee for the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. I'm moderating this panel, which is examples of applications of the rights of nature around the world. And I'm really excited to be moderating this particular panel. There's so many as I look around the room. Um, this movement is so vibrant. And so many of you could actually be sitting up here on this panel. Um, and yet, um, I'm excited to share the stories with all of you from the people who are on this panel. Uh, and to share their leadership and rights of nature around the world from the places where they live. Um, each panelist is going to speak for eight minutes, and then assuming we have time, we're going to take questions from the audience as we did last time. We're just going to remind you to please be quick uh, and concise and make sure that what you have is a question for one of the panelists. We've heard a lot of discussion from a lot of different perspectives about rights of nature as a tool, not necessarily as a destination. And when we look at the idea of law and what is law and what is it for, we look to this idea that law is a mechanism for how we use, uh, how we use power to implement a particular vision of the world. What are the dominant values? They're not the only values. But under current system, current structures of law, nature is seen as property. Property to be owned, property to be destroyed, and we see examples of that all around the world from extraction uh, to pollution to just the, the separation of of humans from each other and from the rest of the sacred. Those are all byproducts of this destructive worldview. And we've also been talking about the language of rights and it, it, what that means and how it can be understood. And in particular, the, the language or the use of the word rights as a legal mechanism to understand really what is better described by many as responsibilities. Responsibilities, rights, place, obligations, and responsibilities on us. So these, when we're talking about you know, the system of human laws, we're talking about placing responsibilities for how we interact with the rest of the system of Earth. Because there, is a, there, there are laws on Earth, the system of natural laws, those we cannot, those we must obey. And climate change is, in effect, Mother Earth's response to the fact that we've been ignoring these system of laws. We've also heard uh, from indigenous people here today about this idea of something beyond this idea of governing, uh, this idea of laws, how to legislate words like beauty. How do you begin to introduce the sacred into the sphere of human law? And we're going to hear a little bit more about that in this, uh, in this panel as well. And it's exciting to hear over the last many years since Ecuador has brought this into the Constitution how, uh, how that's changing on the ground. As I mentioned, I work for movement rights in the United States. I also work with communities and indigenous communities to recognize rights of nature uh, in the places where they live, which is work that all of that, that Mari Margo was sharing in her presentation on the last panel. We have a slight change on the, on the panel. Mari is uh, uh, with us here, but she needs to scoot because she has another uh, conference that she has to speak at. So we're going to switch the first speaker and the last speaker. So uh, Casey, Cam Hornick is going to go last, and 
Mari Margo is going to go first. So Mari, I know that you've already uh, had, had an opportunity to introduce yourself, so I'm just going to let you share about the, the work you've been doing around India and Nepal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I'm responsible today for talking about two countries in eight minutes, I understand. Okay. The first place, both places, India and Nepal, both learned um, about what happened in Ecuador in 2008, and we heard from them in not too long after that about how can we possibly replicate the rights of nature um, legal framework in our own countries. I'll start with India. There, as you may know, the Ganges or the Ganga River, Mother Ganga is considered a sacred river. Half a billion people depend on it, yet it's an ecosystem that's in severe decline from water withdrawal, from pollution, agriculture, and other things that are impacting this ecosystem. So we've been working with environmental, public health, and faith groups to draft the National Ganga River Rights Act a national uh, law that would recognize rights of the Ganges to things like exist, to thrive, to regenerate, to natural water flow, to unpolluted waters. So the rights of the river ecosystem itself, as well as the right of the people of India to a healthy, thriving river ecosystem. That drafting process has been taking place over um, a number of years. Um, the Modi, Prime Minister Modi's government has been presented with the draft act and they're considering it now. The good news is that um, that legislative effort has been boosted by um, several court decisions that have taken place over the past 18 months in India. In northern India, in the state of Uttarakhand, the high court there, which is the state high court, um, issued two decisions in March of 2017, which you may have heard of. Um, the first recognize rights of the Ganga and the Amana rivers within that state. And the court wrote that it was necessary to recognize these rights in order to, quote, preserve and conserve these rivers. Several weeks later, they issued a second decision, and this is regarding glaciers um, and other ecosystems. And again, the same court found that it was necessary to recognize rights of specific ecosystems in order to, quote, preserve and conserve those rivers. Understand that within that state and within the country of India, there is no rights of nature law like there is here in Ecuador, not in their constitution, not in their legislative frameworks. And so what the court did is something quite extraordinary. That is, they had to look outside of their own national borders and see what was developing on the international stage. And what they found was rights of nature. And they determined that they needed to bring it in to their own country, even though there was no underlying law, and actually rule on it to find rights of, ri of rivers and other ecosystems was necessary in order to protect those ecosystems. Now, on July 4th, um, of this year, the same court, and one of the judges has been the same throughout all three of these decisions, recognized rights that species have an inherent right to live. The court wrote that uh, the animal kingdom has inherent rights to live. So they've moved from ecosystems now to species, which is a very interesting development. Um, what's happened now, of course, is that the state of Uttarakhand has appealed those first decisions to the India Supreme Court, Unsurprisingly, um, they were given instruction by the court to take several in steps that they needed to actually um, implement the rights of the Ganga, and they have no interest in doing that. And so in their appeal to the Supreme Court, they, among their arguments, they're arguing against this idea that ecosystems, that nature can be considered a legal person. Within the court decisions, they describe nature as having, being a, legal person with certain rights. And they wrote that that means all the rights, duties, and liabilities of a living person. So when you consider that, how can nature possibly have liabilities or duties or obligations? And the answer is it can't. But the court ruled that it does because it's a legal person. And this comes to a point which I think is very important for us within this room, but also within this movement, is to think about why legal personhood isn't necessarily the construct that's going to be working for nature. Um, and because legal personhood before courts all over the world have this rights and obligations idea in mind. And so in appealing this decision about the Ganga having rights of personhood, 
the appeal reads, you know, what happens if the river floods and kills somebody? How do we sue the river for killing a human being? And of course you can't, it's absurd. Um, and so we've been in a place in my organization in which we're starting to think about how do we move beyond this idea of legal personhood and unfortunately the best thing I've come up with thus far to call it is legal naturehood. And the idea though is that understanding that legal personhood as a legal framework was never intended for nature. And so there's no reason to think that nature is going to fit well within it. Um, and so we need to develop something different so that there's a proper place for us to understand, to interpret, and to decide um, these court decisions regarding nature. And we think that is something probably called legal naturehood. It doesn't sound great, but that's where we are. So that's what's happening in India right now. These court cases are coming out. There's national legislation that's being introduced. Um, and then its neighbor, Nepal, also inspired by what's happening in Ecuador and contacted us. Um, and so over the past nine years or so, they've been in the development process for a new constitution, much like Ecuador was. Um, in their constituent assembly, we met with them to talk about including the rights of nature in their constitution. That didn't um, end up happening, and now their parliament, we've been meeting with members of parliament from the Himalayan region and across the country to talk about and amending their new constitution with the rights of nature, specifically recognizing rights of the Himalaya. The Himalaya, as you may know, is considered by many to be the world's third pole. So the North Pole, the South Pole, and the Himalaya. And unfortunately, it's a mountain range that's warming faster than any other place on Earth. And that impact on the people, on the ecosystems, on the species, on the water in Nepal is going to be tragic because everything literally is downstream from the Himalaya in Nepal. And so we're proposing a rights of the Himalayas constitutional amendment that would recognize rights of the Himalayas to a healthy climate, to exist and to thrive, and the people of Nepal to a healthy, thriving Himalayan ecosystem and climate. And this is a coalition that's building that includes environmental groups, includes civil society groups, mountaineers, trekkers, indigenous peoples, and part of the language um, of the draft law says um, that the Himalayas our right to a healthy climate that's, quote, unaltered by human-caused pollution or emissions. Today, Nepal is on the receiving end of climate change. It has a fraction of climate change emissions every year, and yet it's seeing its glaciers and its ice disappear. As one Sherpa told me in a meeting, the mountains are turning black in the Himalaya. And so I'll leave you with that. It's a tragic circumstance there, but we believe that we can move this forward. And there's increasing interest as they're looking at the international community and they're looking at existing conventional environmental frameworks and not finding anything there to help them protect the mountain range. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. To tell us a little bit about what's happening in Europe and in Sweden, uh, Pella Thiel, who is the director of the Rights of Nature Network and also part of End Ecocide in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here with, with all of you people and, uh, uh, and with this panel. And uh, also, I want to greet all the people who are not here but who are in the same mission. And uh, I believe I have some slides actually. I hope you can see, because I don't have that quote here. <laughs> I wanted to talk about hope. Um, so the first slide is on hope. In Sweden we still have hope. Yeah, yeah, I'm not worried at all. <laughs> I'm hopeful. Um, we still have hope in, in the sustainability agenda and in the system as it works. Uh, but here is a quote, soon, I hope, from uh, Will Falk, who is the next friend of the Colorado River that uh, Mari was speaking about earlier. He was one of the people who was supposed to represent the river in court. And here we go. The truth is... <laughs> Okay, I can speak about why I wanted to talk about hope. I wanted to do that because I am one of the grassroots people that Katarina Hovden spoke, spoke about earlier. I think it's true what she said, that rights of nature in Europe is very much a grassroots movement. And um, 
generally, you know, we, we know what doesn't work in society and we know basically what to do. We know we have to protect nature, but how do we get there? How do we make people move? And that's why we need hope. And uh, while we are waiting still for the quote, um, I just wanted to say something about how it is in Sweden. It's really, I think, a different process than for many of you because we are, we are like the sustainability stars uh, globally in Sweden. We are number one in many cases and also in, for human well-being. We are regarded as a, um, a good society. Uh, and. Uh, that makes it a bit hard to question society and the system because we are really loyal still. Uh, people in Sweden still believe in the system, they believe in the government, it's crumbling actually, but generally there's a strong loyalty and we think that uh, we are on a good path. Uh, that makes it a bit difficult to question um, where we are because this is everywhere, even the, the green movement is sort of, yeah, but we're working with sustainability. And, uh, yeah, we are, but um, we also have one of the largest ecological footprints in the world. Um, we still cut our forests and make them into plantations. We still allow mining without almost even a, a mineral tax. We are like a banana republic in, of mining, probably worse than here. Um, and actually, there is a somehow still a dissonance is growing and an unease is growing. But what we also have to to, to sort of handle is that Sweden is really a consensus culture. So we look at each other and saying, oh, do you know, is that something true? Is that something viable? Is that something that can be done? And if your friends doesn't legitimize uh, what, where you're going, uh, it's probably not, that's probably in the long term, it's probably not uh, serious or, I don't know. Um, so, I think that in a situation like that, to leave hope, you actually have to find hope someplace else. And um, what we are doing is a lot of things. We're working with education, a lot of awareness raising, organizing people. Not so much yet uh, in the legal sphere. We have a budding um, um, network of lawyers, thanks to Mari, a lot. Um, but when I'm out speaking, and that's actually in um, a lot of uh, circumstances. Just last week I was speaking with a group of municipal ecologists, civil servants, and also... Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the truth is, I never thought we had a chance in hell. I saw the lawsuit, the Colorado River lawsuit, as an opportunity to guide concerned people through a process that would shatter their false hopes, replace them with experiential knowledge of the vast difficulties inherent in working for change within the legal system, designed to protect exploitation of the natural world. So there might have been, even if this lawsuit didn't move through court, there might have been a lot of hope shattering, which was, was actually good. We can have the next slide. Yeah, because I'm gonna have to end soon. <laughs> okay, um, so what I wanna say is um, Sweden is top of sustainability class and um, the hope that when people learn about rights of nature is actually almost tangible and that's really hopeful to me. There is a people in Sweden that had has lost their hope a long time ago, and that's the Sami people, the indigenous people of the north that live in um, Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Russia. And they have been colonized quite recently, uh, in the 19th century mostly, and lost a lot of their culture and their language, and especially their lands. And. Um, 
There is a great decision recently, yeah, we can have the next slide, from, from the Sami parliament in Sweden, where they in May decided to support the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. And I believe that's that makes them the first elected assembly in Europe to officially support the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. And I'm really honored to uh, bring greetings to all of you from, uh, from these people. That's Marie, Stefan and Mona there. And they are greeting all of you, but um, especially the indigenous brothers and sisters whom they have had great strengths in, in this very, very fast process that they have had supporting the declaration. They have looked at what, what you are all doing. So, um, a lot of greetings. One of the things I think we are doing is in this um, line of work is to create a safe space for people to think that actually we could go someplace we didn't think was possible. And um, uh, we've had two conferences on earth rights and uh, with, with the help of Mari Cormac and Patricia Gualinha, we have created that safe space to investigate this idea of earth rights. And I want to also invite you, we can have the last slide, to um, a conference we will be holding in May next year, which will be um, uh, outside of Stockholm. Next slide. Please. Oh! Oh, there we go. No, next. Uh, and you are all, uh, you are all warmly invited, and it's not yet um, decided what this conference, this meeting place, this safe space will be about. So if you have ideas or needs, please come to me, and we can see what we will together make of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm glad we got the slides working. There is hope after all. As I mentioned, there is a part of the Rights of Nature movement that is uh, really about going beyond this as sort of a legal tool, but really talking about the spiritual, the holistic, and the sacred, and how to really build the bridges between the legal and the cultural. And it's really exciting to have our next speaker uh, Hilda Santi from the Sariaku in Ecuador and the work that they've been doing around Cossack Sacha and um, delighted to hear what they have, they have been accomplishing there. Buenas tardes, todos y todas. Primero agradecerle por haberme contido esta invitación para estar aquí con ustedes. Mi nombre es Hilda Santi, yo soy del pueblo originario Quichua de Sarayaco. Aquí he venido para explicar lo que es nuestra propuesta Causa Xacha Selva Viviente. Causa Xacha, en idioma Quichua, Selva Viviente, ser, ser vivo sujeto de derechos. Decimos ser vivos porque dentro de Pachamama, Madre Tierra, existen seres vivos igual que el ser humano. Esto nos enseñaron, esto no hemos investigado, esto nos enseñaron nuestras madres, nuestros abuelos. Vivimos en esa vida, conocemos la realidad. Por eso este pueblo siempre mantendrá todo y transmitirá este conocimiento. Por lo tanto, nosotros este conocimiento transmitimos desde muy niño. Antes de que se vaya a las escuelas, ya una madre en sus chacras, ya un padre en su lugar de cacería en la pesca, ya va enseñando a los niños muy pequeños, desde muy pequeños. Por eso hemos apoderado este, este conocimiento, nos vamos apoderando y estamos transmitiendo para los pueblos originarios. Nuestro territorio no se puede mercantilizar, no se puede vender, porque hemos vivido miles y miles de años en ese territorio. Por lo tanto, 
Proponemos un modelo de vida en los criterios de riqueza. La riqueza, tal vez para el mundo occidental, es tener un carro, una casa, un edificio, un avión, todo. Para los pueblos indígenas, para los pueblos originarios, la riqueza es tener ríos lleno de peces, selva sin contaminar, aire sin contaminar, esa madre tierra con abundancia de eh, alimentos. Eso es la riqueza para nosotros. Muchas de las veces nos han confundido nuestra propuesta que nació del pueblo de Sarayaco, el suma causa y que hablábamos, ahora ya está escrito en la Constitución, es gran confusión para nosotros nos han confundido terriblemente, nos quieren comparar, el suma causa es tener una casa o edificio, el suma causa es negociar con las empresas multinacionales. También podemos decir, eh, dentro de esa vida, esa riqueza, también tenemos aillos, aillos quiere decir el conjunto de familias en la comunidad, donde que trabajamos con mingas, donde que apoyamos, donde que hay una reciprocidad entre ellos. Esa es la riqueza para nosotros. Donde que nosotros fortalecemos nuestra organización. Cuando yo era pequeña, yo siempre veía que todos estos pueblos éramos súper unidos. Transcurrir el tiempo, ya cuando empezaron las empresas a ofrecer migajas, dádivas migajas, compraron a nuestros elementos, a nuestros dirigentes, ahí viene la destrucción de la organización, la división de la organización que nos ha amargado a las madres que hemos vivido en ese territorio. Por eso hemos presentado esta propuesta al gobierno nacional como una nueva categoría, porque tenemos esos conocimientos que jamás nadie, ningún antropólogo, ningún científico habló de este tema. No conoció, porque nosotros sí conocemos. Por eso hemos presentado este como nueva categoría, para que el gobierno nacional acepte, para que el pueblo nacional haga constar en esa constitución, esa norma, esa regla, que se conste la propuesta de Causa Xacha. En Causa Xacha, porque sabemos que existen, incluyen los seres de los mundos, de los mundos que hace toda la mañana escucho de, eh, las palabras de estos grandes eh, catedratas que están aquí. Yo no soy, solamente soy terminado en la primaria, disculparanme nomás si en algo me equivoco. En esos mundos, tenemos mundos animales, tenemos mundos vegetales, tenemos mundos minerales, espirituales, cósmicos, donde que todos los seres hemos relacionado para una buena supervivencia. Todo esto es intercambio de los seres humanos, los lugares, los pantanos, los árboles. Nosotros sabemos que en ese lugar, ese lugar es sagrado, ese, esos, esas montañas tienen amos, esos ríos tienen amos. Entonces, eso tal vez ustedes no comprenderán y otros gobernantes nunca van a comprender. Y donde que nosotros transmitimos estos conocimientos, estos, estas selvas, estos ríos, estas montañas, transmite ese conocimiento a nuestros yachas, esos yachas comunican y esos yachas nos transmite ese conocimiento hacia nosotros. El conocimiento de yachas, esa mente no es negociable, es respetable. Todos nosotros aún ya hemos respetado, los niños han respetado, pero ahorita con este conocimiento occidental todos nos quisieron destru destruirlo. En este momento los gobiernos descentralizados ya están negociando, ya están negociando con, con carbonos, con venta de carbonos, negociación de carbono ya está en la provincia de Pastaza, ya está. Como pueblo de Sarayaco, hemos presentado, tenemos una demanda en la Corte Nacional Internacional que tenemos un juicio ganado que todavía no está siendo cumplido. Y por lo tanto, si las nacionalidades, como organizaciones regionales como FENIAI, CONAI, COECA, no denuncian de lo que está haciendo nuestros gobiernos descentralizados, provinciales, como pueblo de Sarayaco, 
después de ocho días vamos a denunciar de lo que está haciendo. Tenemos 1.400.000 hectáreas como pueblo quichua, donde que hace pocos días hemos declarado que esos territorios deben ser selva viviente, declarado un proyecto de vida como selva viviente. Entonces, por lo tanto, eh, yo les eh, declaro, pues, como pueblo de Sarrayaco está declarado preservar y conservar de manera sostenible los espacios territoriales y seguiremos siendo libres, libres de todo cualquier extractivismo. Y por lo Sarayaco no vamos a permitir, queridas hermanos y hermanas, apoyémonos entre todos llevando esta propuesta hacia sus países, a países del mundo. Camp Hornet of the Ponca Nation of Oklahoma, and um, among many other things, um, Casey and her nation have become the first tribe in the United States to recognize rights of nature for their land. It's difficult to speak to you on this day. I feel you deeply in my heart. Those of you whose name I'm just learning, those of you that I've known and worked alongside and been with in important moments in our lives, Those of you that I'm just meeting at this time, I wish I could call you all by name, shake your hand and give you a hug, know your families, know your ways, because I appreciate the warrior in me, the warrior for peace and the warrior for our mother, the earth. I want to first say thank you to those who organized this gathering. And it may seem like that was humans, But I believe that those very humans are directed by the one mother that we all share, by the one father, the father's sky, by the beauty of the sun rising today and the moon mother giving us rhythm and the sacred waters that flow through us all and the winds that are the breath that we share with all the green things and those of the roots and the ancestors whose bones are sustaining us at this moment. I give thanks to those indigenous people of the Ecuadorian forests and to the ancestors who are underneath and above and around us, the spirit nation that guides us at this moment. My mind is full. I heard such beautiful words about the laws, about the legalities. I believe that when I closed my eyes and listened, there were many paths that were open to me through those legalities, through the ways that the Ponca Nation has created a statute that is called the immutable statute, the immutable rights of nature of the Ponca Nation of Oklahoma. Immutable because it's always been and we are simply recognizing the ancestral voices and simply remembering and reacting to and becoming responsible to our mothers, our grandmothers, 
our great grandmothers, and the warriors who stood beside them, in front of them, behind them, and around them to make a way for us to survive what has been unsurvivable through the onslaught of the types of killings that only humans can imagine. I stand in awe of my relative here and her proposal. I stand in awe of those folks from New Zealand that we visited in May, I believe it was, of this year. And I feel as if the things that we need to understand is that all of those roads lead to one ending, and that is the protection of the Mother Earth so that human beings can come back within the natural cycles of all that is. It is us who are the juveniles who have escaped and run away from home and done dirty deeds. It is us as human beings who bear the brunt as we should of climate change because of the manner in which we have allowed ourselves to behave and continue to behave. It is us who has to take the lead in recreating, reconnecting with all that is and to begin to understand that the natural cycles of life are all of these roads that have to be taken. The laws have to be looked at. The natural laws have to be understood. I walked outside a bit ago. You know, I haven't said thank you to all of you in the deepest way that I could. My brother Tom Kootu, for all the ways that he has sustained our people and brought us into this world called environmentalism that we called ancestral knowledge. I haven't said thank you to my niece, Osprey, for bringing me to weekend to meet with 100 women who were beginning to understand how we rebalance, not become equal to men, because that will never happen. Men can't have children. Men can't create life. They can give us that seed, and we can take care of that sacred seed and allow our mother, the earth, to encourage us to grow cell by cell by cell by cell. Those things are sacred. At that meeting, I met my relative, Shannon here, who talked about this thing called the rights of nature and a law that was going to surround it. And I thought no, no law should be created around nature because we are she and she is us. And we cannot separate ourselves by making laws around ourselves, by building cages to put ourselves in one more time. But over a period of time, I came to understand that there is only one way for those colonists to understand how deeply and how strongly and how fiercely we will protect all that is so that we may continue. And that was to create a, a law called the rights of nature, the immutable rights of nature and the Ponca Nation where we will hold the heads of the corporations to the standards that we believe that our relatives should deserve. I walked outside and stood on the sacred ground, the grass that was breathing with me. I touched a sacred tree that took me back to my Sundance tree and loved me. I looked up at the Thunder Nation and felt the winds blow. And I thought, how could they think that they could buy and sell this grass? How do they believe that they can buy and sell the air? What nerve do they have to think that they can buy and sell the unborn's future in whatever form that future is, in whatever form that unborn is? So my relatives would come together in this middle of time in this time of prophecy of the eagle and the condor coming together and joining hands. In this time of prophecy where we say that the red nations that come from the quadrant all the way down to the south, down that way, will rise and teach how to live in harmony with all that is. And I say thank you to you because you are that. You are that each and every one of you. I especially thank the young people who are here, who are carrying this through. I thank the ancestors who imbued us with these knowledges that are in our cells, in our spirits. I thank the filling of my mind, my eyes with you, my heart and my spirit. We behind the head.
Casey, and thank to all the panelists for sharing the exciting work of, of this movement around the world and for deeply reconnecting us with the rest of the spirit world with, um, and, and to see, as Pella said, the hope that exists in this room emanating around the world. We, oh, okay. Gracias. Eh, mi pregunta es para Mari. Eh, me interesa saber eh, el caso de India. Entiendo que apelaron o quiero saber si es que ya apelaron y el caso ganó o perdió o si está en proceso de apelación. Gracias. The two cases in India that have been appealed to the India Supreme Court, uh, they've currently been stayed, which means that the decisions that the court issued have been stopped from being uh, implemented. And ultimately, there might be a trial. It's unclear if the court will, they keep putting off dealing with it. Um, so it's unclear what the Supreme Court will do. That hasn't, however, prevented the same Court, the state court from issuing its decision in July around rights of the animal kingdom. So I think that's actually quite inspiring. Um, I would say that, you know, in the United States, when um, the civil rights movement was really gaining um, power in the 1950s and the 1960s, students sat down um, at lunch counters, black students sat down at lunch counters, even though they knew that they wouldn't be served and that they would be arrested for sitting there. And people said, well, why would you do that? And they said, because we got to start somewhere. We have to sit. And more and more people might do this. And indeed, more and more people did and sat down at more and more lunch counters and ultimately led, led to this desegregation of those counters. And so I think you can think about this court acting in that same vein to say, basically, you need to keep sitting down. Even when they tell you that you can't, you need to keep sitting down. Um, and so I. I welcome the court's decision, and I hope it will continue to make decisions like this, even if the higher court doesn't acknowledge it or respect it. Um, I think it's something that I find both deeply inspiring and critically important for building this movement. We have a question down here in the front, in the blue top. Down here, can we go down here? Thank you. Hi, my question is for Mary. Um, so a lot of the corporations have rights, um, and you think that when you would tell lawmakers the corporation have rights, obviously nature should get rights, you think that they would do it in a heartbeat, but um, clearly they haven't, so I'm wondering uh, what excuses they give you for that when you encounter them, and what kind of arguments you give. Well, corporate rights um, are not, of course, unique to the United States, um, but it's a place where they have been exploited um, beyond really any sense of belief. Um, corporate rights are clearly incompatible with nature's rights. The local laws um, that we've been involved with developing, as well as the laws that are now moving to the state level, they specifically um, address those key legal doctrines which stand in the way um, of the rights of nature, corporate rights being one of them. So essentially they eliminate corporate rights at the local level when they would interfere with the rights of nature. Similarly, the state constitutional amendments that are being proposed um, would uh, authorize local communities to eliminate corporate rights within them because we are not going to be able to protect the environment, recognize the rights of nature so long as rights, the corporate rights continue to stand in our way. Um, so the, you ask you know, what sort of excuses do um, you know, governments give or industries give for why corporations need to have rights and essentially it's very often the same answers which is, you know, corporate, corporations are critical to our economy, are critical to jobs, they're made up of people and therefore those people as a collective should have rights within the corporate form. So it's, it's illogical from the standpoint of trying to protect the environment, it's perfectly rational for those who are most interested in expanding wealth and commerce and development. Um, and I would say that you know, within the United States, I, I hope there's a growing recognition that our legal system 
has been designed specifically for the endless production of more, the endless growth, endless development. And corporate rights is one of those legal doctrines that makes that possible. And so there's very little interest in eliminating it. We have time for one last question. The gentleman in the white with the microphone. Sí, aló. Eh, sí, perdón, es para, para todos, escuchando a nuestras honorables eh, conferencistas indígenas y a las otras, veo como, como un águila con, con dos alas que son distintas y que no podría volar con solo una de ellas. Me parece que nosotros los no indígenas hablamos más de derechos y me parece que ellas hablan más de principios y valores. Y la pregunta es esta. Creo que tenemos que trabajar los derechos porque con eso estamos trabajando el presente. Sin embargo, los pueblos indígenas nos hablan de que siempre trabajan para las próximas siete generaciones. La pregunta es esta. ¿No creen que ya estamos listos para comenzar a trabajar una declaración de principios y valores que se convierta en esa ala que le está haciendo falta a el águila de los derechos de la madre tierra? Maybe we could give this to Hilti and Casey. Yeah, if I understand you correctly, uh, you're talking about using rights-based laws to, to encourage our indigenous values, if, if I'm... Uh, I had an interesting experience a few weeks ago. I'm an elected official for my tribe. I'm, one of, I'm a councilwoman. Uh, there are seven leaders in our tribe. And the other ones, we put a ban on fracking. We did a resolution around a ban on fracking. We banned KXL, which is a pipeline from coming through our territory. We did the uh, rights of nature and a few others around that. And I was over talking to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is the governing uh, body through the federal government of the United States. So we call it Boss Indians Around, but it's uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, um, <coughs> They asked me, what do you want us to do? We see that you've passed these resolutions. And it, to me, was like the, the courage that the Maori people have said, you just go ahead and do it, and then you deal with what happens next. I was very happy to find out that they're now telling me, what do you want us to do? And I said, exactly what's on that piece of paper. We want, to ban we want a moratorium on fracking and injection wells and we want the rights of nature upheld. In whatever form that takes, we expect the federal government to back us in that. Sí, exactamente los pueblos indígenas, eso necesitamos, las leyes. Las leyes que se ha creado, pero que se ha cumplido. Porque muchas de las veces hay convenios, hay acuerdos, que no está siendo cumplido con, con los pueblos indígenas. Y por lo tanto, pues yo les agradecería a todos los profesionales que nos empiezan a, a creando leyes y para hacer cumplir eh, nuestras, nuestras normas, nuestras vidas que estamos sufriendo en los territorios. So just to summarize where we've been, we've been to, on this panel, to the Ganga and Nepal. Um, we have been to Sweden and to the Sami people and the rights of Mother Earth there. The spiritual beings and the rights of the living forest in Ecuador to, uh, to the prairies of the Ponca Nation in Oklahoma. And I think what is fascinating and amazing and, and uh, gives me the most hope is that the message is the same uh, and that this, the, the, this panel of inspiring people who are moving this work really forward on the ground um, are speaking not for themselves but really from the earth and so we take that with us for the rest of uh, for the rest of our journey and the rest of our time here, I thank you very much for joining us here on this panel. Thank you. Thank you.